and welcome to Newsnight, where we speak to major league players in Nigeria's democracy and the issues generated from its drive for growth and development. I'm Ladi Akiri Dolwale. Thanks for joining us. The latent insurgency in the northeast region of Nigeria and the security challenge it continues to present gains our attention on today's edition. We'll also be talking about the ability of states to pay the new minimum wage, as well as the repayment of bailout funds loaned from the federal government. We will also touch on the vexed issue of restructuring. My guest is the governor of Gombe State, Mohamedou Inoua Yaya. Your Excellency, thank you for your time. Welcome to Newsnight. Thank you, Mr. Akaridulu. It's my pleasure having you. Now, um, You're welcome. Governors um, mm. seem to be a bit in the eye of the storm at this point. Certainly. And why do I say that? I say that because there are two principal issues uh, that are probably occupying attention. One is the issue of minimum wage for yeah. your workers. Yeah. The second is uh, the federal government's uh, desire to recover the money it loaned the states uh, way back uh, in 2016 yeah. as uh, support. Um, first, at the level of Gombe State, what is the situation in terms of your finances? Oh, the situation is like everywhere else, but our own is even worse, terribly worse, because as a state, if you check through the revenue allocation table, you'll find that Gombe is virtually second to the last. I think we only top Nasarawa and HT, or we go virtually on the same level. And... Uh, that means we go with four billion, averagely about four billion in a month. And uh, because of the commitments, you know, in terms of repayments and the payment orders, in, uh, standing payment orders issued by the last government, Gombe goes with just three billion because one billion goes off direct from source. And when we go with three billion, you have uh, 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 salaries to pay of 1.25 billion, and equally other standing payment orders, commitments that you must pay in order for government to basically run to the tune of about 600 million, making it 1.8 billion. So if you add up, two, already 2.8 billion is off, leaving you with 1.2 billion. And with that 1.2 billion, you have to run all the system. You provide basic education, you provide in terms of you know, sec senior secondary school, and, and, uh, and you maintain, you know, the water works, hospitals, agriculture, and virtually everything that is needed for you to live, make the people feel that at least there is good governance. So 1.2 billion translates to just about, uh, 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 about uh, uh, $1 million. Or oh, three, sorry, $3 million at the exchange rate today. Gombe is 3.2 million people. So that will mean on the average of spending, you know, just a dollar per month for each person in Gombe State. You can imagine what that is. And it is upon all that that now there is need for us to pay the outstandings and even add up the new minimum wage that you are talking about of, uh, of 30,000 proportionate to the number of staff we have and the salaries, if you put it up, that one is another 300 million on top of our wage bill. And above all, you know, you, uh, uh, government is now asking that we pay 17.5 billion, which we did not, as far as I'm concerned, we did not even see that record until we had to dig very deep into the accounts after the transition that we got to know about it. So if at that time they couldn't ask that governor that took that money to pay, you know, they now ask us to pay. It means equally dipping into the little that we have. So eventually we'll have a system collapse. That is inevitable. With reference to the minimum wage, the, in the case of the minimum wage, that is now law. That has been signed into law by the president and yes. is supposed to take effect from April the 18th, um, which means that even as we speak now, quite a lot of time has gone. Uh, between then and now. So even if implementation was to start today, there's areas to pay. Exactly. Given the picture you have painted in the case of Gombe State, uh, what are the options that are available now? I have no other option than to call people 
tell them the reality because we have to govern by the realities on the ground. There is no way I can just print money and come and give to the people. No. There is only one or two ways that you can get money in order to execute government programs or to run the government. One is the statutory allocation, which comes from the Federation account, and I've given you an analysis of that. Second is the internally generated revenue. Gombe, as I said, doesn't generate up to 300 million per month, and we are 3.2 million people. So if we cannot generate that money and we cannot get it from Abuja, then why else? Because uh, people that money? listening to you now would ask the question, how come Gombe cannot generate more than 300 million a month? Bad governance and poor practices that refuse to allow us to, one, tax the people correctly, two, apply the little resources correctly. Because for me, any little money you have, if you indulge in expenditure that doesn't impact on the people and you do go for, you know, mundane things that are really doesn't, uh, they are not helping the people, it means somewhere, someplace, you have to now source money to fund social welfare and to fund all the things that people will need in order to have the feeling and presence of government. So the previous government, particularly the last governor, did not care about that. His concern was not more of on a human capital, but on flimsy white elephant projects that are not really touching the people. If you go and see big money wasted, you know, on an international conference center, the one in Abuja is not even sustaining itself. In Gombe, that is having the challenge of security, you know, having the challenge of uh, social, you know, uh, I mean, uh, upliftment of the people, you know, who will care to go for any conference in Gombe? Two, wasted money again, 6.2 billion or more on a mega motor park. For me, people don't go to sleep in the parks. You only go uh, to join vehicle and travel to wherever you want to go. And even those places too need to be taxed. And you put up higher institutions to the detriment of basic education. You don't maintain schools to the extent that now Gombe ranks 31st. And it has been consistently so in the last eight years, you know, on the 31st or 36th position down the ladder, you know, in terms of ranking in education performance, basic education, that is NECO, WAEC, and whatever. So if we are down there and you put emphasis, you know, putting up a university that you cannot sustain, a polytechnic that you cannot sustain, and you cannot even have the basic materials to take into the tertiary institutions, it means you misplace priorities. And that is why I say the former governor and the government were clueless because they did not focus on real issues that were touching the people. Two, they were heartless because in the process of executing all the projects, you know, they did not touch on our real business community and where they touched them, you know, they did not pay them. They are, we are having a stash of liabilities now which we have to pay. And on top of that, you know, I told journalists the other time they asked me that they were reckless because they did not manage our resources well. That is the true situation. As at, at today, Gombe is owing 119.2 billion. A lot of people will be surprised that you're saying this because your predecessor, like you, uh, is an accountant. And not only is he an accountant, he was accountant general of the federation before taking up uh, the position of Gombe state governor. It doesn't matter. An accountant has to do the correct thing before he gets the figures or he gets the uh, governance to go right. If he did not do the correct thing, it means he did not apply his education and knowledge and experience correctly. So if he did not do that, and as, as a result, people are in this mess, then call him anything else. But for me, he's not a prudent and he's not a sound financial manager. How do you intend to turn this situation around? We'll do our best. We'll do our best. One thing for sure is I must make sure I carry the people along. And that is why I care to tell people the true figures. And then if the figures don't add up, there is no way. I cannot print money and I cannot do nothing. So people have to come and share in these pains that we are in so that we can patch up and move forward. Now, uh, two things. Uh, you mentioned, of course, one uh, in the course of your uh, uh, reaction to my last question, and that is the issue of security.
yeah. when you talked about security. How are you dealing with the challenges of security in Gombe? Because Gombe too has been affected by a number of things, including the insurgency in the northeast. See, it's spilled. good that you are even mentioning that. Many people don't even know that really Gombe is affected, including even at the highest level that is in Abuja. One, we share boundary with all the five states, the other five states in the northeast. So we are like encapsulated within the northeast in the center. Two, for those that have little, you know, money to move around, after attacks in either Borno or Yobe or Adama, the only place they can go to in the first instance is Gombe. So we have a lot of them that come to have around us, and we cannot say no to them because they are our brothers. Mind you, we are both, all of us, came from the north, and not only that, from the northeast. So one way or the other, relationships have joined us, and we are the same people. So we have to accommodate them, and we have to take responsibility of whatever. So with, with the stress resources that we have, you can imagine what this government is going through. That is one. Two, you know, the poor structure of the security agencies themselves. You know, they don't, they don't have enough personnel, even in, in the other frontline states, talk less of those that are in fringes like, like Gombe. You know, so no personnel, ill-motivated people, and equally uh, having to have uh, the effect of those in the front line states, even within the security forces themselves. So we are just managing and uh, we are trying by whatever means, you know, and luckily this time around we're pushed for them to know. For example, the NYSC orientation camp built by Gombe State Government during Gorgeous time, you know, was taken over as a safe corridor. You know, for them to rehabilitate the Boko Haram uh, uh, victims. Yes, not only the victims, those that surrendered and now want to imbibe, you know, the good culture of living with us. You know, they have to be retrained and be reintegrated. So for them to have a little training and uh, get the necessary correction to live with people, you know, they are camped in Gombe. And that one denied our own people, you know, the right to use their own farms because they don't allow, you know, tall crops to grow there and all our food crops grow tall. If you talk of corn, if you talk of guinea corn, if you talk of whatever, you know, they are now left to uh, only plant beans or, or, or groundnuts or whatever. That one is not, our, it's just like, it's, they are like cash crops. What did if they tell you is responsible and for? And they not? don't allow our own people, you know, to go to the market. Why? why? Because Sorry, before it, you go on, why do they not allow your crops to grow tall? Because it, it will ob obscure, you know, visibility and that will make uh, a, a possibility of attacks. From okay. us, yes, from, uh, from Boko Haram colleagues that may come to rescue their people or to attack the security uh, agencies that are managing them. That is one. Two, they, it denies our people to go to the markets, especially on that road where the camp is located. Between Gombe to Yobe, Portisco, you know, there are two serious markets that, you know, our people must go to. And eventually at night, they are not allowed to move. So we both miss in terms of agricultural production and we miss in terms of market accessibility. So the people, are, and that covers about four local governments. So imagine what that is. And on top of that, now the NYC is asking that Gombe State should put up another NYC orientation camp. So it's like with the resources that we don't have. And no compensation was given to us for that NYC camp, despite the risk and despite the consequences that our people are going through. So it's too bad. Um, now, general security across the country. Um, I'm sure as the chief security officer of Gombe State, by now you must have received several um, briefings about what is going on, yeah. uh, particularly as it relates to Gombe. But talking generally, mm -hmm. there is banditry, cattle rustling, mm -hmm. farmers, herders, clashes, kidnapping, and so on. Um, some of your colleagues in some of the other states and indeed some of the other regions uh, are taking on the tasks themselves, as it were, to handle some of these security challenges, uh, introducing some kind of guards uh, to comb the forests and to bring down tall areas to uh, enhance visibility. In other places, they are joining forces to establish uh, neighborhood watches and so on and so forth. 
in your area in Gombe and then the northeast, what, what's the collaborative effort, if any, between you and your colleagues in the other uh, northeast uh, states? Well, we as governors and as colleagues, we are touching to one another and we copy from, you know, states that are directly involved in it. Yobe and Borno, you know, have to go on, you know, uh, like uh, an arrangement whereby the local vigilante are taking care of their own security. We too have them. We go by the hunters, you know, the vigilante groups, and uh, even uh, a little contraption of, you know, these youths that are uh, becoming, uh, you know, restless, you know, they are being t carried along so that they provide that cover. But above all, what is most needed is for us to have a collaborative understanding and support, especially with the security engines. And most, the most difficult thing that maybe has to be taken care of is the issue of financing the security agencies with the correct equipment and correct intelligence and reconnaissance, which is very lucky. So we have to now find ways and means, but we are trying. We have to push because eventually what it will uh, maybe uh, dovetail to is to make sure that every community takes care of itself with an arrangement of uh, local policing or patrolling. Would, would you be, in that respect, um, an advocate of restructuring or true federalism in the sense that would you be supporting, would you be supportive, for example, of allowing a state like Gumbi to form its own police force or its own community Look, police to handle matters as they relate to Gombe. Because I support people, I mean states, you know, taking charge by contributing to security management because naturally nobody can cover you or give you security more than your own self. Yes, but funding is a challenge. So if we we'll have collaborative understanding with the federal government, with clear guidelines, I support the idea of having state police because it is a state police that will now relate, that knows the nooks and crannies and will be dealing with its own people. And every governor should be able to take responsibility. But now it's like a fluid arrangement whereby nobody owns it and when there is failure, people will run away. But if you are as a governor and you have people around you and you can manage them and you can ensure results from them, definitely you should take charge and take responsibility. I go by that. Let me, bring you, let me bring you to something equally contentious, and uh, it will be interesting to hear your view about this. The uh, issue of minimum wage. Hmm. Minimum wage, salary, uh, gratuities, pensions. Uh, all this, of course, relating to civil servants and former uh, uh, civil servants at the level of the state. Um, there's a new minimum wage. As I mentioned well, earlier, yes, yes, it's now law. Yes, yes, yes. Um, Will Gombe State pay? Well, I've already painted the scenario to you. Or let, then we that have, is, let me adjust we have the question. Between the state can and Gombe State pay? Yes. At the moment that we are, I've given you the true picture. And I've told you that what ends up for, people, for the government to manage the citizens of Gombe State with is barely a dollar per head. You know, if you want us to encroach on that, I'm out of in paying salaries. You know, we have 67,000 civil servants between the state and local government. And uh, if we have to pay them, you know, at the moment, without the additional minimum wage, the civil servants alone in the state, you know, go with 1.25 billion. If you add up those from the local governments, 650 million, excluding the teachers, and if add up with the teachers, is another 1.2 billion. So if you add up, it's 2.4. The new minimum wage alone, if you want to pay, is another 300 million on top of the payroll. So you can imagine what that is. So compare and contrast, you know, the demands, you know, and the cost. It's now left to you to analyze. But the truth of the matter is productivity has to increase. And for me, I know, and personally, I feel that 30,000 even is not even enough to sustain a person, talk less of a family. So for those that depend, on that salary alone, they cannot live. What you've so painted now like is an impossible oh devil yes. and deep blue oh yes. situation. That is not because you have to analyze it. This is a clear thing, and you have to be very objective in taking a decision. So, what it means is, as a people, you know, not civil servants as a group, 
not the government or the executive like me as a person, but as a people. We have to come together and map out the way forward for this country. Otherwise, you can add up whatever, but that will not be enough, you know, to cover because productivity has to increase, you know, prudence has to increase, so that I make sure that the framework on which the economy revolves, you know, is the correct one that will make us to be self-reliant and self-dependent. That will mean if we do so, at least we can take the salaries to any level, but there will be enough productivity for us to accommodate it. You know, and there will be enough for everybody. Because if the economy is not working well, and you only restrict your welfare or service to the civil servants, and you don't get to the real people, the whole, the total number of the people, Sorry for you, it will not work and it will not add up. Now, uh, talking about getting to the rest of the people, one of the uh, phenomena, who, uh, uh, phenomena which uh, exists not just in your state but across the northern region is the issue of the Almajiri system. Mm -hmm. um, and some of those who go through this system uh, end up being radicalized mm -hmm. and they then join some of the groups that are creating the security challenges mm -hmm. in many of the areas. Mm -hmm. Some of them don't join Boko Haram. They create their own groups within the, the states where mm -hmm. they go through. Yeah. Now, in the past, there had been efforts to take them off what is currently the system and put them into something that is more formal, that involves both religious education and formal education, mm -hmm. uh, with a view to making them useful and employable. I think you are teaching of the Almazari school. Yes. Or what? Yes. Okay. Now, uh, as governor, you're, yeah. you've just you, you, you've just become governor. What is your own thinking about that group? How do you think their situation can best be addressed, knowing what you know? Yes, the idea of taking off those people that are out of school, in whatever form, whether Almazari. You know, al are receiving an, another type of education, which is not formal, so to say, which is not the Western type, with, to the detriment of Western education. But there are those that don't even go to any school, and there are plenty in number. So we have to grapple with those issues, both those that go to al school and those that don't even go to al because no matter what, they are Nigerians, and they are our people, and they are our children. And mind you, Gombe State alone, has close to 700,000 people you know, that are out of school. Who ought but, to be but, in school? Who ought to be? They ought to be if they are really our children and we really cater for them, welfare-wise, you know, and we think of their future and we must guide and control them to take them to the correct place in the future, they must go to school. But given, what you've, told me, so, given what you've so, told me, yeah? given what you've told me, yeah? how is that going to happen? That, that, because that it requires happen, money. Because, yes, it requires... Among other things. Sad, 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 certainly, uh, government is devising another program, you know, which is BESDA, Basic Education Service Delivery for All. BESDA is like coming as a grant to all those states that have that challenge, you know, of the out-of-school children. And uh, we are going to take off all those children because I'll make sure we spend whatever we get judiciously so that these people, mind you, why it didn't work the other time was that the correct people were not approached, were not even carried along, in, and focus was only given to, you know, putting up structures. So if you give contract and the schools go dilapidated, you know, and they don't function, they don't work, then it means money goes only with structures without touching the people, which means there was no focus on the human person. But now I've gone around. Within these few, few months that I'm there, I've gone around to see, and for, for, for that matter, we have five of such schools that had been abandoned. In Gombe State? In Gombe State alone. And those schools cost about 400 million to put up. So, which means the benefit was really on contracts, not on the people. I took one of them and approached Ubeck and told them we'll turn it into like a teacher resource center so that there will be a continuous training and retraining of the teachers because the quality of teachers too is very low. And I equally met with the, uh, with, uh, the group, or the council of the local uh, 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 sheikhs who are in charge of those schools just to have their buy-in. And with that approach, I think, we'll solve the problem 
of you know having to train all our teachers to make sure they give good quality education to the children and we shall equally carry along those sheikhs and their almajiris so that they will all equally come and feel you know that uh, there are many ways by which you can do this mind you for me is not only in structures no but you must have teaching materials you must have quality teachers and you know and you must have the ways and means by which you can encourage the people to go to school with the help of the traditional uh, system the leadership and the sheikhs and i believe with the new approach whereby we get to them directly and give them the support especially with the school feeding arrangement inshallah will carry them and make them to be in the net in the safety net of quality education that brings me to something else which is linked to security is linked to culture is linked to livelihood and it has been very contentious i mentioned it among the things i was talking about earlier when i was talking about the various forms the security challenges mm -hmm. now face mm -hmm. which includes uh, which is the herders farmers thing yeah now, ever since it has, it has started, the mm -hmm. people have tried to come up with all kinds of solutions mm -hmm. to ensure that the farmers are not shortchanged, the herders are not shortchanged, mm -hmm. and conflict is removed mm -hmm. between them. Mm -hmm. So there was cattle colonies, oh, then yes. uh, ranching, mm -hmm. and then Ruga. Mm -hmm. um, and then the federal government itself came up with the NLTP. Mm -hmm. uh, which one is Gombe going to do? We'll go in, into all. I have How? reasons. Oh, yes. Because for us, this issue of cattle rearing is not a new thing. A bulk, in fact, a bulk n a number of our people are solely dependent on livestock uh, development, livestock rearing. We equally have farmers. 75% of Gombe people are peasant farmers. Some involved in agricultural production, crops. Some involved in livestock production. So we have to manage all. 75% means whatever we do, three quarters of us are involved in that thing. So by whatever means, we have to make sure we give them comfort. That degree of comfort that would make them to be proud citizens and to impact on the economy. So as far as I'm concerned, we must make sure in whatever way. That is why I said we are involved in all. And you see, we have to backtrack. Look at the system as it was pre-independence, when there was a uh, white man in charge, you know, they created uh, 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 what they call uh, grazing reserves, which are gazetted. Gwambe alone has 223,000 hectares, you know. So if somebody somewhere says he doesn't have land for, uh, for colony or for Ruga or whatever, we have. And Ruga, mind you, is not a new phenomenon in the north. Ruga just means a small settlement outside whereby people, you know, those that breed these cattle are off you so that they don't cause any havoc or disturbance to you. So if you are to enhance their own uh, condition, why not? You help them in order to get so, and they are citizens. So we have to provide them and their own children. And mind you, even before now, there was issue of nomadic education. So schools were being taken to them but they were not taken in the right way or, or, in, or on, on the correct path. So they could not access good quality education. They are human beings too. And even at this moment that I'm talking to you, close to half of the 21st century gone, you know, we allow people to trek themselves and their cattle for over 500 kilometers or 1,000 kilometers between the north and the south, you know, continuously. I think it's very inhuman. We must find ways and means by which those people will have comfort and in the process, we we'll avoid clash between farmers and herders. And you know, because of the explosion in population, you know, the cattle routes have been blocked, either for housing or for farmland. You know, so, uh, do you expect them to carry the, head, the cattle on their heads? But, uh, Your Excellency, there's a cultural aspect to this. Uh, you, you did mention it uh, in, in the course of your answer. And that is that for those who are outside looking in, they are told that the movement with cattle, which you just described, is a cultural thing. That the, the idea that herders move with their cattle. But no is culture that says that you should not look for comfort. No culture says you should not look. If you go around the world, you know there are economies that are solely dependent on livestock and dairy production. If you go to New Zealand, if you go to Argentina, 
if you go to all those places, you know, are dependent on livestock and they are doing a lot and their people have changed. So if our people could not get that because maybe they were misguided or there was no knowledge, proper knowledge, and you know, and there was bad governance, at this point in time, we should have good governance, good governance that will provide that framework, you know, in order for them to be uplifted and moved along with the rest of the people. That is my argument. Now, uh, you, you also alluded to the fact in your answer where you said, oh, if there are some people who are saying they have no land, uh, that yes. you have land. Yes. Now, that, that speaks to the politicization of this issue because it seems as if the country has almost been divided into two. In the north, many of you and your colleagues say that, look, we have land and we're going to key into mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. Down south, many of your colleagues are saying they have no land, including the chairman mm -hmm. uh, of the Governors Forum. Mm -hmm. He says in Ekiti, there's no land mm -hmm. for this. Yes. Now, how do you bridge that gap? Because at the same time, people point out that northerners don't consume as much beef mm -hmm. and dairy products mm -hmm. As Southerners do, which is where what you talked about, the movement down south comes mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you tackle this if those who are consuming see, if say we they use don't our have our economic sense to manage our resources? There is no way you can insist on one rule or one law for every place. We have to be flexible. And mind you, wherever there is comparative advantage is where you are supposed to put your resources. There is comparative advantage, you know, for us to create Ruga up in the north. You know, to give these people good quality education so that they can manage the livestock properly. And you know, and you can put up schools, you know, and along the line, you know, the value chain will increase and include people like you that cannot really rear the cattle to put up uh, abattoirs and whatever. You can now slaughter these cattle up north and transport them, you know, as meat to Lagos or to Port Harcourt or to any other place in the south. It doesn't cause any rift and you can even export it. So why don't we encourage these people? Yes, but why, why this argument you make mm -hmm. seems very reasonable, but why don't you make this kind of arguments at the Governor's Forum meeting? Who or told at you the I National did not Council do so? Who told you I did not? As far as I'm concerned, I had said it before, and I'll continue to say, whether federal government will go for it or not, for me, at least, we'll engage these people, and we shall find ways by which we uplift our people. So we are going for Ruga. If somebody says no, that is his own business. And mind you, when there was rift in the Niger Delta, to the extent that uh, you know, uh, they could not allow uh, 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 oil to be you know, explored, you know, Eradua came up with uh, amnesty. amnesty. Yes, and it helped in solving the problems. So we have to be creative by way of doing the correct thing in different places so that we'll carry everybody along. I'm not stopping anybody from saying no, but for us, we say yes because it's, it helps in creating a solution to us, both for the farmers and for the herders. You talked about population explosion when you were offering the explanation as to what led to the conflict. Oh, yes. Uh, um, former President Lucia Gwambasanjo recently talked about the population explosion, mm -hmm. saying that whatever authorities at the federal or at the state level attempt to do by way of development mm -hmm. will always be stymied will be difficult mm. because of the issue of population. Now, because before you put in place educational institutions, health facilities, and so on, the population has increased. And at the rate at which Nigeria's population is increasing calls for us to take a much deeper look at how that is going. Mm -hmm. The UN says that by 2050, Nigeria will be the third most populous country in oh, the world. Yes. Uh, the two who are in front of us mm -hmm. are China and India. Yes. They're they far, they're light years ahead of us in terms of development. Mm -hmm. And they've proven that they can look after their people. Mm -hmm. Do you buy the idea that we need to curtail this our population growth? We need to, I agree reasonably, but we shouldn't do that at the expense of our own culture and tradition. And you know, not only that, you know, compared to China, you know, Nigeria is just about like one-tenth of China in terms of both population and land mass. I see the population sometimes as an advantage. It took China only about 40 years to transform and change and go to the, become number two, in fact, or number one economy in, in the world. What stops Nigeria from doing so? You think it's impossible? 
We should take advantage of the population, make sure we create, because it's a market. We become more productive, and then our economy will grow, and everybody will feel, uh, will have the prosperity in here. You talked about culture and tradition, and you mentioned China. Mm -hmm. In those 40 years that you talked about, China put in place a one-child policy. But they have changed. Now yes, they but are that's after oh, becoming oh, oh, yes. So, uh, But for us, we are not yet China. So proportionate to that, let us have that level of commitment. Let us have the level of understanding. And let us make sure we are our brothers keep us. That is what will make us work. Did you see a Chinese man, you know, carrying away billions of naira just because he, or, or billions of dollars for himself and his family? Did you see? And what is the consequence for doing so in China? What happens here? If you continue with these corrupt tendencies, you know, and you allow everybody to go with, without falling by to follow the law and order, then, sorry, there is no way. But we have to be uh, on the ground, and we have to make sure we do the correct thing, because that is the only way the correct thing will come to us. Now, you mentioned corruption, oh, uh, yes. which is something else that seems there is a consensus is part of our problem. Yeah. We have the resources, but because of the way oh, you've yes. talked about because it. Because corruption because leads to misapplication of resources. And if you don't apply and manage the resources properly, you will not get the good results. So at the end of it, you only be mentioning is corruption, corruption, and it's corruption. Because it dovetails to corruption, no matter what. No, but people say that the current battle against corruption being fought by the federal government led by your party uh, mm -hmm. over the last four years mm -hmm. plus, um, has been one-sided, has been selective. That even if you were, taking you, Your Excellency, as an example, if you were previously in another party and you came across or you were, you were being investigated for allegations of corruption, once you move to the APC, those allegations mysteriously no, take a back People are not being fair, but you can imagine. A former Senate president that was APC was being prosecuted for cases that harbor around corruption. Even governors that left of recent, you know, they have been, you know, chased for issues of corruption. For me, I think this government, the federal government, is working a lot on corruption, but we need to do more. I agree. Now, at the state level, your state, you've, earlier in the interview, we've spoken about the fact that the previous administration before yours uh, didn't seem to apply the resources it got, including the bailout and so on, uh, but properly. Would you, I mean, given the background mm -hmm. of the war against mm -hmm. corruption, would you mm -hmm. be investigating your predecessor's government with a view to bringing those who did this to book uh, or recovering the funds uh, involved? Let me tell you, the day I took over, that the 29th of May, 2019, it was the deputy governor that had it over to me, not the governor. And before then, there was a transition committee in which now for us to do the correct thing, I wrote, including the list of membership, you know, and the committees, I wrote to the former governor that these are the people I constituted, very credible people, led by M.K. Ahmed, the former DG of Pencom, one of the most credible and uh, Nigerians that is having that integrity that is respected for, you know, to handle this thing properly. And I believe that they were going to work for Gombe people. Not for me, neither for the former governor, but for Gombe people. And I ask that we should have a seamless transfer so that you know, we take over government in the correct way. They did not get the cooperation. So abruptly, you know, we came in without getting the proper handover documents until the handing over day on the 29th of May, then we are given a bulky document. Does that mean we should go into governance with closed eyes? I had to open my eyes. I had to analyze. And I told them that day that we shall do justice to those documents. And we did. So eventually, we came out with a clear report, which we are pursuing. And that is why you can see that uh, I set up a committee, you know, to go through and make sure all those properties that were disposed of improperly, you know, that were shared because they were virtually shared, should be recovered. So if they don't cooperate with us, what next? Two billion in 2014 was taken from Central Bank, you know, that was supposed to go on, on small and medium enterprises, was used to buy bakery equipment, Chechen Fab, and whatever. 
which was kept for close to four or five years until the last day, just on the eve of their leaving office, they now discounted the price and gave out to people. And now Central Bank came up, you know, demanding that Gombe Steel will still pay that two billion with interest. That two billion added to the 17.5 billion you mentioned is already taking us to close to 20 billion. So you want us just to pay off or to continue to suffer without talking or without digging to find out really what it is? If it means investigating, I will investigate. If it means prosecuting, we shall prosecute. But we shall not allow that to distract us to the extent that we will leave our course and join them so that we will be equally in the same train. No. Something else that is, um, shall we say, trending uh, at this point is the water resources bill. Um, Alhaji Suleiman Adamu, the Minister of Water Resources, yeah. uh, tried to pursue this during the first tenure, mm -hmm. uh, but either as a result of misunderstanding or politics, uh, it didn't scale through. Mm -hmm. Now, that bill is coming back. Mm -hmm. Do you, as one of the stakeholders mm -hmm. uh, in this project, do you see benefit if that were to become law? Considering that many of your counterparts in the South, and particularly in the Middle Belt, feel that it is another attempt to centralize power uh, over natural resources in Abuja against allowing the state governments to do what they want. So in this case, you are governor of a state. Mm -hmm. Do you see it as taking power away from you at the level of the state? Not really, because the Constitution is clear on these issues. So anything that is not on the concurrent list you know, that has to be managed by the federal government. The federal government must make sure it works or it goes well for all of us. So I don't see that bill if it is meant for us to contribute, you know, to changing our fortunes and making the water system works for the benefit of all of, 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 all of us. I think I go for it. I do. Now, uh, I don't subscribe to the idea that it is being made in order to witch hunt or to punish some people. No. You talked about crops and so on being uh, the preoccupation of many of your people mm -hmm. in Gombe. Yeah. Recently, the federal government says it is going to deny forex to those who want to continue to import food items, which can be produced locally. Are you keen into this? And if so, how do you see Gombe benefiting from this? Oh, definitely. One, for sure, like I said, you know, go through records and you'll see that net net Gombe was like a, an exporter. And we still export within the context of Nigeria. And I believe most of our commodities go even outside Nigeria illegally. So if we encourage the people to produce more and along the line, you know, make sure that we process all those materials or products that we produce here, you know, in order to make sure that, yes, it gives job you know, we get a better quality and we can export, it will help us out. And we have enough land, we have the people that are virtually jobless now, that are not encouraged to do. So instead of allowing finished products to come in, we may suffer for a year or two, but at least if we encourage people like we did in terms of rice production, all the other products we can produce and we can end up becoming net exporters and not net importers of food. I support the idea. 100%. Now, um, as we begin to wind this down, there's something that Gombe State is uh, well known for, uh, mm -hmm. but which remains practically untapped at this point, and that is uh, mineral resources. Mm -hmm. uh, you have quite a lot of them yeah, in Gombe, yeah, yeah. but they remain on, uh, under the ground. Of course, the argument previously was that uh, mineral resources were on the exclusive list, yeah. and only the federal government, but then your colleague who is now in AKT and who is chairman of the governor's forum mm. was minister of uh, solid minerals. And in, during his tenure, this, the federal government did say any state mm. that wanted to pursue the exploitation of mineral resources within, it would be uh, free to do so. Uh, now you are in the saddle. Mm. Are you looking at this possibility at all, given what you've told us already about the financial situation, I mean, mm. of the state? Well, inadvertently, what it means is we must encourage private investors. 
you know, because if we continue to sit on the materials, minerals, natural or whatever, without exploiting or making them work for us, there will be no change. So we shall encourage investors. If necessary, we can partner with investors, you know, to make sure we exploit the mineral resources so that we benefit. Mind you, Gombe, like you said, has a lot of mineral resources. We have uh, kaolin, we have silicide, we have coal, we have uh, limestone. Well, there is nothing that virtually, even gold, we have. So we'll partner with them, and to that extent, we have already formed, uh, and uh, very soon, a bill will pass for us to set up uh, a, a Gombe uh, Investment Development Agency, Investment Promotion Agency, with which now we can, you know, engage people that are interested so that we, 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 can, we, we can provide them the necessary atmosphere, you know, to set up businesses and industries that will uh, uh, improve on our economy. Even if it is for us to, you know, generate enough internal revenue, you know, and use for the development of the people, I think it will be advantageous. So we shall work on that. We'll provide engagement for the people through that. And uh, I believe if we join our mineral resources together with the agricultural products that we have, we'll come top on the shiny, on the, uh, to shine in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the savannah. You know, mind you, our, uh, uh, our motto is Joel in the savannah. We shall continue to shine, inshallah. Finally, Your Excellency, as we, as we wind this down, let me put you on the spot. Accountants. Mm are not known for spending money. They rather would like to collect and keep. Mm. Um, but in your current capacity, mm. that may prove a bit difficult. Yeah. Uh, because apart from every other thing, you are also now mm. a politician in politics. Mm. And in politics, mm. you must be a bit more generous than the accountants are mm -hmm. uh, known for. How are you finding the transition from collecting and keeping to having to be a bit more flexible and generous? No, very sorry to say that uh, I believe there is always an exception to the general rule. Mm -hmm. By my pedigree and uh, training and uh, by my vocation, you know, uh, there is no way I can continue to see money not being invested properly. But I'm a strong advocate of uh, proper application of resources. So for me, the idea is human capital development. And if we are putting in money, no amount is too much for you to improve, to put in improving the human lives is too much. So if we get money and apply in bringing positive change for the people, so be it, we can spend to our last couple. If it was spent on the people to the extent that now it can help them to generate enough money for them to pay, I wouldn't have quarrel or ask any question. But if you misapply resources and you don't get the correct result for the people, sorry, it's not in one. So uh, I, I, I think I'm an accountant with some difference. <laughs> you didn't answer my question, Your Excellency. I answered you. I said, how are you making the transition? Because now you're having to spend. I am patching up. I am patching up. I will continue to patch up. The most important thing is for me to make the difference that by the time I leave, at least I will make sure that I left a better place than I made it. Your Excellency, it's been a pleasure thank speaking you. with you. Thank, thank you very thank much. You. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Very much. Thank, you. Yeah. thank you. That's News Night. Do let's hear from you on what you've heard today and much more. The handles are right there on your screen. I am Ladi Akiridu Luale. Thanks for joining us and goodbye.